Most little girls think it's a Barbie car. 45 miles per hour, I wouldn't dare take it any faster than that. One of the most exciting cars ever made. Gangsters even like this car. It was a good wheel spinning car. I always tell everybody it takes 20 years off of you just to sit in the driver's seat. Henry Ford was a boy on the farm. And the farm life didn't really appeal to him. What he did see though on the farm changed his life and that was a steam traction engine. He left the farm much to the dismay of his family and worked in various mills, uh, machine companies. He was very much enthralled with this idea of a gasoline engine and tinkered at home with various pieces of pipe and various objects. He created a gas-powered engine. From then, Henry went to build his first automobile. He built this in a rented garage on Bagley Avenue in Detroit and called this automobile a quadricycle. People were very hesitant because they felt the horse and buggy was here to stay. Through various backers, he came up with the means of building his first race car, which was 999. Uh, he finished that in 1901, and it raced a straight race and averaged top speed of about 96 miles an hour, which at the time was a record-breaking speed for any type of American race car. Ford had built several automobiles, um, going through the alphabet from Model A to Model S, uh, some which were very successful, some which were not. In 1908, um, Ford by that time had moved from the Mack Avenue plant to a plant in Detroit called Piquette. Um, on the third floor of Piquette, there was a room, and in that room, 24 hours a day for three months, he kept his chief designers in. Uh, three months down the road, the door opened to that room, and the product was the Model T. Ford, for the first, probably the only times in his life, made an understatement and said, I think this will be one of the most successful cars around. Well, in the history of motoring, it was the first car that was cheap enough to be bought by everybody. So it literally put America on wheels. It put a lot of other countries on wheels. A lot of things could change because people could get places faster. This is a 1912 Model T touring car. It's called a brass Model T because it has a brass radiator. And it's a touring car. It's not a closed car. It was one of the cheaper models that was produced. A very simple car, a very rugged car. Demand for cars still exceeded supply. So that's when Ford shut down for a while and developed the moving assembly line where a worker would stay in one position and do nothing but screw on one bolt and the cars would whiz by him. Uh, production in the year 1914 exceeded production for the four previous years combined. Ford cut the normal workday from 10 hours down to eight hours and paid these people $5 a day. But with an eight hour workday, he was able to run three shifts. So he could keep his assembly line and his people moving 24 hours a day. This vehicle is a 1915 model TT fire truck and the TT stands for ton truck. Ford sold the vehicle basically as a uh, engine in a bare frame and you manufacturers would put their own vehicle body on it and this one was built into a fire truck and it served in Texas for many years. Uh, the next one is a 1921 Roadster. It's uh, a two-person car. That, of course the top would lay back on it and uh, it's a very nice car as well. This car is a 1924 Model T touring car. Uh, it was the cheapest year that Ford produced cars. This car was $295 new. Top speed of the car is about 45 miles per hour. I wouldn't dare take it any faster than that. It's really not safe. This vehicle is a 1925 Model T doctor's coupe and it was very popular with doctors because it had a lot of trunk space and it was a very compact car. Model T's have a reputation of being all black. That's only partially true. From 1908 to 1913, Fords were offered in a variety of colors. These colors, however, though, wouldn't dry fast enough to allow the assembly line process to keep building onto the cars. So Ford imported an enamel, oddly enough, from Japan, called Japan Enamel, that could be sprayed on these cars and the paint would dry as the car would move. 
as opposed to painting a body, waiting for it to dry before you can assemble pieces on it. From very early on, Ford had a strong sense of branding, but took two separate lines in their marketing. One was to market the familiar and the homely, and the other was to explore the idea of a second car for women. Most obviously in a brochure entitled Her Personal Car, which inside shows women taking tea together and their cars parked neatly outside the windows. There were over 15 million Model Ts made from October 8th of 1908 until, um, I believe, September of 1927. Um, Henry Ford didn't want to discontinue the Model T. He wanted to keep building it. By 1925, the Model T was rapidly becoming an obsolete car. Ford was forced to close down factories and Model T production and come up with a new car. That new car, because it was so radically different, he started the alphabet again and came up with the new car being the Model A. While Ford had a great success with the Model A, GM countered that with a six-cylinder car. Uh, the six-cylinder car started to gain popularity and Ford not wanting to hold on to the Model A, even though he was doing well with it, like the Model T, once again shut down production and came out with the V8. This is a 1932 Ford convertible sedan. Well, the 32 is, a, is sort of a milestone car because it, uh, it was the last ditch attempt by Henry Ford to overtake uh, Chevrolet in the sales figures. And uh, it was the first year that uh, Ford introduced a mass-produced V8 motor to the public in the United States. The V8 motor really took it a quantum leap forward. Prior to this, there was a four-cylinder, which was sort of stodgy and slow, slow moving. But the V8 was, was quick, it performed very well, and it gave the American public really a, a car that was performance-oriented. It was a very powerful engine, and uh, Ford went to great lengths to prove it, it was uh, reliable and, and had a relatively high performance. It had uh, 65 horsepower, and uh, he once also he put it on like a, a 50,000 mile endurance test to try to prove its reliability. Gangsters even liked this car. Bonnie and Clyde uh, wrote Henry Ford a letter at one point and told him how they really Every chance they got to steal a Ford, they would steal a Ford because it was their, their car of choice. Actually, this car was produced in the, the height of the Depression. Uh, the Depression in this country started in 1929, but it was, it was an absolutely full swing in 1932. And so people that would have purchased this car would have been individuals that didn't want it to, to appear to be ostentatious and show any wealth, but still required a good transportation. Well, the styling uh, is largely the responsibility of Edsel Ford. For a low-cost, highly produced car, it has excellent lines, and they, the lines have maintained their, their quality all this time, and uh, today I think it's still an outstanding looking car. I think the grill is uh, absolutely timeless, and, and I like the idea of the, the headlights being outside the fenders. Uh, they later did away with that in, in cars in subsequent years, but that's, it's very distinctive looking in the, in the round fenders and the round grille and the, and the whole uh, appearance of, of flowing lines is really appealing to me. It had leather upholstery and uh, wood graining on the dash, and ashtrays, and things that were really uncommon in that period of time. Altogether I have six 32 Fords and uh, each one of them is, a, has a, is its own character and its uh, own peculiarities. This car has a very difficult clutch. One of my other cars, you feel like you're, you're driving a power steering car. This car steers very heavily. Stopping is a whole another experience. Some want to turn to the right, some want to stop straight, some, and, and as hard as you might try to get them all to work the same, it's just virtually impossible. We well, have to remember which car you're in, because it, uh, if you think you're in the one that goes to the right and you're in the one that goes to the left, it's a whole nother matter. I think that the 32 Fords are rare, but the 32 Chevrolets are even more rare because 
they just weren't built as sturdily as Ford's were. And uh, these things are, are almost bulletproof. They're very, very sturdy. And uh, that was a trademark of Ford. He, uh, he overkilled the engineering by a large degree. Edsel Ford and Henry Ford, even though they were obviously very close father and son, always saw things differently. Um, their split, if you will, probably started back in 1925 with Henry wanting to keep the Model T and Edsel wanting to move on. The decision to move on was obviously a wise one, um, but the two didn't really get along in later years and Edsel's death is attributed to a bleeding ulcer which a lot of people, including Edsel's wife, feel Henry was the cause of. After Edsel's death in 1943 and the war and Henry's death in 1947, there was an end of the era. American society in general was so happy to be out of a long, very bitter war that things went wild. Architecturally, went, we went wild. Musically, we went wild. Film and theater-wise, we went wild. Not surprisingly, we went wild with our cars. And Henry Ford II came out with the Thunderbird. 10 or 11 years old, 1956, 57, and a young fellow just got out of the Navy in town and he was promised a nice automobile when he came home and his parents bought him a brand new Thunderbird of 57. I thought it, God drove it. It was so beautiful. And of course it was the only one in town. As far as I was concerned, it might as well have been the only one in the world. My thought was to jump in it and spin the tires. How fast will it go and where can we go? Great car to go out and get ice cream in. And uh, it's something proud to own. It was a time in our country when a new car meant something. It was a success status symbol, which it particularly isn't today. Well, in 1955, you could own a three-bedroom home, a new Ford station wagon, and a Thunderbird for about $20,000. If you had those things, you've died and went to heaven. What more could be expected? You know, you've done everything your mom and dad told you to do. Two kids, a lawnmower, blacktop driveway, some geraniums. Is there anything else in life? The fender skirt is a panel that covers the wheel opening on the back of the car, two-thirds the size of the tire. Well, if you visualize the side of the car without the fender skirt, there's going to be a very little piece of metal between the door opening and the front of the rear tire. And to most people, it looks structurally unsafe. By adding a piece of tin, a shield, a fender skirt, it fattened up and strengthened and lengthened the body. It served its purpose. I think they called it seventh heaven on wheels. Thunderbird is an Indian name from the southwest of the United States. The Thunderbird was more or less a god of rain, and the Indians did their chants and whatever uh, to allure the Thunderbird to come through the sky, and when they heard the clapping of the Thunderbird's wings, obviously rain come, which was necessary for the crops. It's a sports car if you drive a four-door sedan and you're accustomed to it or a station wagon. However, it's not a sports car if you drive a true sports car. And it has roll-up windows, it has power steering, power brakes, things that were not normally found on a sports car at that time. It's a sporty, personal car, period. Uh, the speedometer is highly optimistic, I believe. Uh, I would hate to do 150 miles an hour in any car, especially that. Uh, I would say that probably 110 would be more like it with a good tailwind. It was a good wheel spinning car, powerful. And, well, you can hear the sound. It speaks for itself, doesn't it? There are no sun visors on a 55 Thunderbird. Uh, engineering goof. Uh, they made them in 56. Maybe 55 wasn't a particular sunny year in Dearborn. Uh, it certainly wasn't a car for everyone. Uh, limited seating. And it was also expensive, it was a $3,000 car. It took me to 1968 to get mine. I'd rather not even say. 
how many I bought. Uh, more than most any garage could hold over a 30 year period. I've really dedicated myself to them. Working on them is more fun than driving them to me. Uh, the satisfaction of doing a little work and tinkering and hearing it run again or painting a fender or whatever means a lot. Uh, I think it beats fishing, it beats bowling, and it beats mowing a lawn. And I certainly indulged in them. Uh, you can't eat one peanut or one piece of popcorn. And uh, I don't see how you can own one Thunderbird. Oddly, with the launch of their futuristic Thunderbird, Ford ignored the chrome and rock and roll of the era and dwelt instead on the conservative hunting, shooting and fishing images in their early brochures. By the mid-60s, the Thunderbird had grown into a big car and was not that far removed from Ford's large car line, if you will. So Ford designers, wanting to keep up with the Joneses, came up with another sports car. Uh, the sports car was called the Mustang. But the Mustang, when it was introduced at the World's Fair uh, in 64, in April, it was an instant success. They sold a million in 18 months. They could not get them fast enough to deliver them. This is my 1967 Playboy Pink Mustang Convertible. It's totally a member of the family. Granddaughters think we painted it pink just for them. We didn't tell them anything about original color. They don't need to know stuff like that. Most little girls think it's a Barbie car, but um, it's, it's more than a car. It is a fun way of life. Well, when people say, how many Mustangs do you have? And I say, eh, somewhere around 200, 250. They look at me like, okay, you've lost your mind. But then I tell them I live at a salvage yard. I guess this is probably what you call a mom and pop operation. Uh, in our country, that's what we call a business that's run by a husband wife team. Bob fixes them, I just keep the books. We've had some people come and say, oh my gosh, I've died and gone to heaven to find all these Mustangs in one place. It, it just attracts everybody. Occasionally, we get, some, we get a lot of military guys here who have Mustangs, so they'll come up at the traffic light and they'll say, hey ma'am, do you know where Mustang Village is? I say, follow me. I get followed home by some of the cutest things you ever saw in a Mustang. <laughs> when we bought the car, it had been painted red. Okay, so I drove it around about six months red. So then we tore it down and Bob called the paint store to order the paint and gave them the mix number. The guy called back in a few minutes. He said, this is some blankety blankety blank pink. Bob said, send me two gallons. So we painted this thing pink. It's like, okay, people said, I thought your Mustang was red. I said, it was. I heard old ladies look better in pink, so I bleached it. <laughs> so <laughs> there's the story of my pink car. Oh, well, they, they call me the pink lady, you know. We were in Charlotte in 94 for the 30th anniversary of the Mustang. Well, there was a very special guest or two, one being the President of the United States. We were the first people ever to receive their trophy from the President of the United States. And then after the trophy presentation, he sat in our car and were photographed by jillions of people. President Clinton has a 67 Mustang convertible, yes. <clears throat> I'll have to say mine's in slightly better shape than his is. <laughs> and he said the same thing, so. In fact, he said, um, hmm, if the keys were in this, I'd just drive it off. I told him, I said, nobody but Bob and me drives that car, <laughs> so. <laughs> but it was, it was um, impressive. It was a car that became an American icon. Um, a red 65 Mustang convertible is 
still very and still deep in the hearts of collectors and enthusiasts and just people that remember the car. It's wonderfully classic lines, wonderfully nimble performance, and a car that'll be everyone's favorite, much like the Model T was in the 1920s, the Mustang was in the 1960s. There's something about the Mustang driving a classic car that brings back a part of your youth. I always tell everybody it takes 20 years off of you just to sit in the driver's seat. And when I really want to show off, I do this number and it takes off the dust and the wheel covers. Well, you just pop them off and you tape the center real good and you put them in the dishwasher with your regular dishwashing stuff, one on one rack and one on the other. And they come out so nice and you got no skint knuckles. You know that, this is housekeeping with no sharp edges there, but that you get cut on those things. But that dishwasher does it really good and then you leave the dryer on and they just come out so nice. Well, I had to drive a rental car. It was a Chevrolet. I drove that Chevrolet because I had smashed my real car. Like I never figured out how to get out of that thing. So I was down at the local stop and rob. Oh, excuse me, that's a junior food store. And uh, there was this guy who rides a bicycle. I hadn't seen him before, but I didn't know he knew who I was. He said, Miss Mustang, you having a hard time getting out of that Chevrolet. You want me to come open the door for you? <laughs> so <laughs> you never know who associates you with what. But when you drive a car like this, people remember you. They do. They may not like what they remember, but they remember you. <laughs> I can't imagine not having that car, though. It's fun. It's, it's me. The Ford badge, I guess, symbolizes, if anything, tried and true. It symbolizes approaching a hundred years of successful car design. Now they're trying everything. They're making small cars that everyone can afford. They're making luxury cars that few can afford. They're making sports cars like the T-Bird. They're making cars that are intermediate, somewhere between, say, a Mustang and a big sedan. They're making sport utility vehicles. They have the Lincoln line, the Mercury line. couple of years, the majority of the shares of the Ford Motor Company have gone back to the family. And it is still a family-run organization. I think the spirit of Henry is still there.